audience, uh, please welcome Matthew Campbell. He works at uh, DigitalOcean as a microservices scalability expert. Um, he is the founder of Airplane and Langfight and is about to have a book on microservices and go published. Um, fun fact about him, he rode into his wedding on an elephant. Right, so, so now you, you have a, I, I'm sure there's an interesting story behind that. And uh, you can ask him that question when you catch up with him in the next break. Over to you. Cool. Thanks a bunch. Cool. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. We came last year, and any excuse I have to come and eat more Indian food is a, is a good reason to come do a talk. So. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about how we actually build the cloud at DigitalOcean. Um, uh, kind of, we're a cloud provider, but we focus on developer happiness. So it's obvious that when we build stuff internally, we want to be happy with what we build. <laughs> and that wasn't always true, but now it's becoming more and more true. <laughs> um, so basically, internally, we use uh, Go microservices to build pretty much all of our new app-based applications. And we're slowly but surely migrating any kind of legacy applications, with the exception of maybe web front ends, into Go. Um, what I thought was kind of interesting is we have very different scales than most people here. So I think a lot of people are developing applications that are you know, being deployed onto a dozen machines, two dozen machines is pretty typical. Um, and we have some applications like that. So like things like if you come to our website or you come to our web front end or maybe you just make an API call in DigitalOcean, that's maybe a dozen machines for an app like that. But on one of the projects that I work on, uh, one of my applications gets deployed onto tens of thousands of machines. Um, and then we actually have a new application that's coming out soon that's going to be running on our customers' machines also. So it's actually going to be scaling to millions of machines. So I wanted to talk about how we do microservice development and how, how the patterns look like when you have like a small application versus a large scale. Because we definitely do different things, but I really want to illustrate how a lot of the patterns really scale up no matter if it's a 10,000 or 100,000 node deployment versus a 12 node deployment. So this is the application I work on. I'm on our monitoring team. So I build applications that monitor stuff. They keep track of the performance of your virtual machines and like how things are running. Um, so it's pretty, it looks pretty basic. We, this, this application you're looking at here is the front end. The front end runs on six or so machines. Um, it's pretty standard. So I want to walk through that one. It's kind of a, it's a, a really good We'll, we'll kind of come to that and I'll kind of as a good example of like what most people are probably building here. And uh, then we'll scale up to some of the more fun examples. So I wanted to step back before we actually go talk about, I want to talk about kind of three major topics today. How we build Go, how we deploy Go, how we do microservice discovery, and how we monitor microservices, which is a lot of stuff. So I'm going to try to go kind of quickly here. But as far as building, um, we do an interesting thing. We actually use a monorepo at DigitalOcean. How many people here know what a monorepo is? N OK, we got about 10, 15 people. So basically, a monorepo is a repository where all of your code lives on one repo. So we have all of our Go is in one repo, and we have 50 or 60 developers that are all editing in this repo. And you think, well, that's crazy. Uh, but we have 40 microservices. And what's kind of cool is we can actually do like cross-cutting concerns across all of our microservices. So like a good example is, I don't know if you guys saw like last week where libc actually had a vulnerability on DNS. And well, that was pretty serious. So we needed to redeploy all of our microservices. So we were able to like make one commit across 50 microservices and deploy them all once. We didn't have to like go to 50 different repos and like find 50 different build configurations. Like there's like consistency of like how we do building, how we do formatting, embedding, and linting of all of our Go code in one place. Uh, so it makes it very convenient to like sometimes if it's in the middle of the night and I need to like make a fix for another team, I know exactly how the other team stuff works because it works and builds the exact same way my stuff works. This is fun. So one of, I think one of the core tenets that we have, so for example, on my team, we deploy three or four times a day. 
across our different microservices. And the only way we do this is we, use a, we, we do a style called pull request driven development. Now, I know a lot of people I talked in the audience, they do things like they have, oh, they, we have my development branch, and then I have my staging branch and my production branch, and then I have like this flow between the different environments. So we just said, we're not gonna do that. You have pull requests and you have master, and that's it. Um, and we actually really enforce this because what we do is we have build bots that enforce that other people are reviewing every single pull request that comes into our system. So that way we keep a very high level of quality that comes into master. And because we do this, that means that we can deploy more often, and we deploy more often means we don't have many bugs in each release, so it can becomes a lot safer to do each of the deployments. All right, so that, that's just kind of the quick, I, this is really one of my personally favorite topics is service discovery. I'm wondering, how many people here are actually using something for service discovery? Not many, okay. Uh, how about, who's using etcd? Okay, like five, six people. Zookeeper? Four people. Some of the same people that have etcd. <laughs> how about console? Okay, we got like, oh yeah, five. So, Sadly enough, we have all of them because different pieces of software have accumulated. But uh, I'm gonna really talk about console today. And if you don't know about service discovery, this is kind of one of the things that you're gonna get into once you have a bunch of microservices. So like, for example, uh, one of my coworkers in the audience, I have to use one of his microservices. But I don't know where, what machines he deployed it on. So we have to use service discovery to find where the other microservice is without like hard coding machine addresses because we're gonna be spinning up new VMs or spinning down VMs all of the time for each of our services. And we can, that way we can do loose integration. So what I recommend if, if anybody is starting to do service discovery is just go with console. So unlike etcd and zookeeper, which are kind of very primitive, console is like a full package on actually doing service discovery. So it actually has a GUI, it has a concept of what a service is, it has a DNS API, it has a Go API, it has a command line API. Like it pretty much has everything you could ever want, you install it and in, in an hour you have the best service discovery system that I've ever seen and it's like super easy to use. Like um, we talk about, we're gonna talk about how we actually integrate. So. We're gonna come back, so that application that I showed you before for our web front end, it may be hard to see on the screen, but basically we have a very traditional application where we have, we have about three different microservices, they interact with each other, and then they have two different databases. We have a MySQL database, and then we have a, a metrics database that we use. But the thing is, is that we don't say like, oh, node one knows about MySQL one, two, three. Like, every single interaction, so like all, we always find our MySQL through console. So we actually use DNS APIs through console, and it says, okay, well this MySQL is up, and it actually can do health checks, so if one of your MySQLs actually goes down, it will actually be able to auto load balance you over to a different slave without your application ever needing to know about where all the MySQLs are. And it's the same thing with the microservices. Like all of a sudden, if I wanna spin up four more boxes because we need more performance, the other microservices can automatically find them. Um, so there's, there's kind of like two traditional ways people have done service discovery. And it, it used to always be done with DNS, and I always recommend DNS first, and console supports this. So basically, instead of like when you're using Zookeeper etcd, you would like query and find out where all the hosts are, this, you just put in a DNS name. So like literally the DNS name is microservice dot region dot console and it will automatically update through DNS where whatever node and it will auto load balance between the nodes too so you don't even need load balancers so in a lot of cases we don't have load balancers between microservices because we simply don't need them um, and it's pretty cool too is if you need to do specific things like you want to find all the nodes of a specific type or all the nodes that are healthy it has a nice go API that you can use also so it's kind of fun. So like we talked about a very simple application and you're like, okay, Matt, okay, well, does that really scale to like 10,000, 100,000 hypervisors? Well, we went to find that out. <laughs> 
So we had a fun thing. We were like, well, wouldn't it be cool if we had service discovery on every hypervisor? Because what would happen is I built the metrics infrastructure. And we would buy 1,000 new servers, and then nobody would tell me. And then they'd be like, oh, why is there no monitoring on these servers? And I was like, this is silly. So what we did is we're like, OK, we should just put service discovery on every one of our hypervisors when they throw them in the rack. So then they can just get the monitoring automatically. So what we did is we started off, and we installed console on 100 machines. And we're like, oh, this is great. This works fine. We installed it on 1,000 machines. And we're like, oh, this is great. This is awesome. This is going to actually work. And then we installed it on 10,000 machines. And all of a sudden, I got a call from the network team. They're like, um, you know all of our firewalls are pegged at 100% CPU across all of them? Are you guys doing anything? We're like, uh, no. <laughs> uh, we're like, ah, oh, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. Well, it ended up being really simple because console is pretty cool. So it, it tries to be like the zombie apocalypse. So it will gossip between all your nodes. But like on 10,000 nodes, it's trying to gossip between 10,000 different machines. And it was killing all of our ARP caches on our Linux boxes. It's kind of ridiculous. Like Linux has like 100 or 200 machine ARP cache by default. So we just like tweaked some kernel settings. And now we have tens of thousands. And we have them in eight regions. So what's really cool is if you want to, want to find all the hypervisors in New York, you can find them. And then the way you can like check all the monitoring across like all the hypervisors in a region. So it makes it really easy because we have a dozen or so different applications that have to run on the hypervisors. And otherwise, we have to like have static list and be like, oh, and we can't do things like just throw in another thousand boxes. Um, let me just talk about that. So deployment, which is always like a four-letter word. Um, Every single company that I've ever been to does deployment differently. Um, we have some of the same issues internally. Some people use Chef. Some people use Docker. Um, we do a whole bunch of different things. But I kind of want to illustrate one of the things I think we do really well. And it kind of applies to how people do Docker. So instead of Docker containers, what we do is we have these things called artifacts. And we have an artifact repository. And you can think of it as just exactly like a Docker registry. But what we do is we say every single commit that we do, we build binaries of every single microservice. And at that point, we can do is we auto-deploy those binaries into our staging environment. And then we have a one-click command that, that promotes binaries into production. And when you want to roll back binaries in production, you just roll them back in the artifact repository, and the machines just find out about them. And this is the same kind of pattern you can use with Docker repos. And I think it it's very, has been very effective for us uh, being able to manage. Uh, this is a fun one. Who here has feature flags in their production applications? Or knows what? There's only like four people. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll tell maybe a bit more about it, because I'm, I'm, I hope more people. So basically, the idea of a feature flag is, let's say that you want to put a bunch of code into production, but you don't know if the feature is stable yet. So like what we do is instead of trying to have like these magical branches that last for three months, we're like, no, we're going to get that code into production. So what, what I do is like, so our team is working on a product that's only in private beta right now. So we have feature flags around all of our APIs that say only people in the beta program can access this, because maybe this isn't the most stable of things. But then we can isolate who can use it. So we don't have like 10,000 customers or 100,000 customers using features that, that are not stable yet. And the other thing you can do with feature flags, which is really nice, is just have them on or off. So that way, you can still start to code things, make sure that they're merging into master and you're continually deploying it. But you can still have the stability of like being able to deploy more often. Um, so we're kind of like, we, we have to do incremental rollouts. So as you imagine, like, if you have an app that goes on to uh, 10,000 machines, you don't want to throw it on 10,000 machines at once. Or, if you do, maybe you'll have a lot of chaos and have fun. But uh, I tend to like to do it. So we're kind of very old school about how we do incremental rollouts. We don't have like some really crazy strategy. We write like five lines of code in Chef. And we just do a hash of like the machine name. And we say that we're going to distribute it to 1% of our boxes. And I found that this is probably the easiest way that, to do it. Like I know a lot of people will talk about, there wasn't much at this conference, but like having a blue and a green cluster, and like we're going to roll it out to the blue cluster, and then we're going to like slowly move users. That's a lot of work. 
and almost everywhere I've ever been, nobody ever gets to this magical state of like awesomeness. So this is like the cheap way that you, in an afternoon, you can still have stable deploys um, monitoring. So this is fun. So like I'm the monitoring guy. Like I get really obnoxious about monitoring at our company. So like I love talking about this. Um, I'm gonna say this: if you don't have metrics on your microservice, they should not be in production. Like that's number one. Um, number two is yeah. So. Uh, we're actually using a tool called Prometheus to do our monitoring. Um, who's using like InfluxDB for their metrics? Well, there has to be more than two people because there was two InfluxDB guys here. So, uh, <laughs> and there's a couple, or they're, maybe they're not using it. I don't know. That's that doesn't sound good. But uh, okay, how about Graphite? Who's using anybody using Graphite still? A lot of people. I mean, it works well. So like, I don't know if they're still working on that, but like. If you're using Graphite, you might want to think about moving from it. Um, but um, so basically with Prometheus, Prometheus is, is basically a copy of how Google does metrics internally. So instead of pushing metrics to your metric server, it actually scrapes metrics off of your server. So like if you have, in our case, we have 10,000 machines, it will scrape them. And then you can have scrapers that scrape your scrapers and roll up to a regional level. And then we have scrapers that scrape all of our regions up until like a global one. So I can be like, what is the health of all of our applications across all regions? And if I want to break into a single region, I can actually go into different levels. And I've not really seen anything great with like Graphite or InfluxDB of like being able to do like these hierarchical. Now, granted, not everybody has eight regions for their application, but you know, it's nice if you need that kind of stuff. Um, if you take one thing away from today, is you, you should install Grafana. Uh, Grafana is probably the most gorgeous dashboard for metrics. It supports basically every single metric system, Graphite, Prometheus, InfluxDB, and it, it's like all your business people will love you. Like everybody will love you when you install this, and they think it was the best thing in the world. Um, structured logging. Uh, so basically, who, who's using structured logging, or is anybody using it? It's more people are using structured logging than have metrics. Okay, that's cool. Um, so basically, the idea behind structured logging is I'm going to like, of course, hit the wrong button and go off the. Yeah. So the idea behind structured logging is instead of like doing sprint Fs and being like, oh, the user did X Y Z and got this error, you actually make a JSON format of your logs, and you actually like put key values of like transaction IDs or user IDs into your log format. And that way, you can actually do things like, oh, how do I see what? So a user calls up our tech support and says, well, I can't spin up a server. We can actually trace through every single API call that that user used and find errors. Oh, well, it's actually the error on the third microservice that runs on Singapore, something ridiculous like this. Um, we roll it up into a tool called Kaibana. So like, you don't really need anything fancy. Kaibana and Elasticsearch is really good. I mean, we end up having a 50-node Elasticsearch cluster, but hopefully most people won't need that large of a cluster. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, you can't see it very well here. But basically, what's cool is like it actually has faceted search. So you can do things like you can break it down by a region. You can break it down by a user. You can break it down by a URL. Things that you couldn't traditionally do with like non-structured logging. And I think if you start a new application today, you should like integrate structured logging from day one because it takes a lot of discipline at first, and the value is huge. But like, if you don't start, you'll just never actually integrate structured logging. Uh, and what's cool is also is that because the logs are structured and it's data, you can actually build dashboards. Like we actually have dashboards that monitor performance of like HTTP requests just from the logs without actually integrating like any other system. Uh, I'm just going to skip over multi-region log aggregation. Distributed tracing. So I'm just going to say this. There was a talk earlier, which was great, that started to touch on this point. But essentially, distributed tracing is saying, OK, I have three microservices. And they one calls the other calls the other. How do I actually know the transaction path? Like, like traditionally in programming, we have a call stack, right? But what does the call stack look like when it's across the network? And that's essentially what distributed tracing is. Um, 
distributed tracing, uh, the tools are really kind of immature right now. The only product that's open source right now that's any decent is Zipkin, and I really wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's really a mess, but the way we do it is we just use Kibana, and we use transaction IDs. So like we have transactions that start at the top of every microservice, and every microservice that you call down, we pass the transaction IDs through HTTP headers, and then we integrate those into the structured logging, so that way we can actually track the transactions in Kibana. It's not the best thing. It would be great if there was actually a tool. So if you, have a, if you ever want to do something fun, this would be a great tool to build is like actually a distributed trace engine. It's not, not an easy thing, but it'd be really cool if you build one. Um, and I have a couple minutes left, so I wanted to have some time for some questions because that's what I love. Uh, get the mic. Actually, I have a lot of questions. I'll probably catch you offline, but a couple <laughs> that I have. Is, so you said you use Kibana and Elasticsearch, right? Yes. So is that all taken from Logstash? No. So the question was, we, do, we, do we use Logstash? So we actually, one of the guys on our team wrote our syslog. Oh. So we actually have our syslog aggregators per every single region. And they do buffering into our Elasticsearch cluster. And we found that that is incredibly stable. And it can handle logs, that, logs of like 10,000 servers buffered into our Elasticsearch. And I would recommend looking at our syslog over Logstash any day of the week. So our syslog is feeding that to the Elasticsearch, is it? Yeah, so what we do is our Go apps only write to syslog. The local syslog forwards to the regional our syslog aggregator. And then that writes into Elasticsearch. So there's a problem, right? Because if you're using syslog, and that's over UDP, Unless you have a TCP version of Syslog, so you're probably losing messages. So, so, so not necessarily. So you can run Syslog over many different protocols. So like, but on the local machine, right, you're going to write to your local Syslog. Sure. But that local Syslog could write, it can write 0MQ, it can write TCP. Like if you're using our Syslog with Debian or any major distro, you can run over other protocols if you're really concerned about the UDP. So the problem is if you use TCP, then you have a scaling issue because now you've got so many TCP connections ending on one server, so that will probably become a bottleneck. Right, and, and that's why we have log aggregators. And this is only a problem for like if you have thousands of machines. If you have a couple hundred log machine or a couple hundred machines, it's probably not. I would wager that you would have thousands of machines, right? Yeah, we have thousands of machines. That's why we have two or three dedicated boxes in each region that, that aggregate the connections of the syslog. Okay. And all these syslog messages coming from your thousands of machines, all the, all the Go microservices. We don't allow people to write logs to disk, is our rule of thumb. OK. And so these, it's all getting routed through Kafka Storm before it? Say that again? I mean, is it, how do you ensure that you're not losing messages? Because now you're getting the volume of messages. As so, so we just have TCP between the syslog on the local machine to the, the lar, our syslog aggregators in the region. I, this is great. Like, I would like to talk more, because sure. this could yes. be like an okay. hour discussion, because sure. I'm really passionate about this. Sure. But we can do a couple other questions. Yeah. Uh, I saw the guy in the back there. It was like he got first, I think. Yeah, this, the guy with the big hair in the back there. Okay, well, it's there. I guess we'll do that, and then we'll pass it to him. Okay. What, what, what's your question? Hey, um, hi, Matthew. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask, uh, you have a lot of different microservices, right? So suppose if some microservice goes down, so or there's some failure, how do you handle that situation? Normally, with a monolith, you deploy the whole application again. So with microservices-based architecture, how do you handle failures? So that was a great question. How do we handle failures in microservices? Uh, and you should talk to this guy in the front, because he's the biggest stickler about this. But we have a rule of thumb is that every microservice is allowed to crash at any moment. So we have to have multiple of every microservice. And then the client libraries that we use between microservices have retries built into them. So that way, like if a microservice goes down, you're going to either get load balanced onto another microservice, or that one should ha hopefully restart very quickly, and you'll, you'll get back onto it. Yep. It's probably for a longer discussion later, but how would you compare using Elasticsearch and Kibana directly for uh, storing uh, logs uh, and monitoring versus using something like Prometheus or InfluxDB? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, how do you, how's it compared just using Kibana to using something like Influx and Prometheus or something? And, and I think it's a matter of scale. And I think ultimately, structured logging and metrics are going to come into the exact same thing because they're going to be 
the same concept. But right now, if I was a small shop and I only had a couple machines, I would just have a Kibana instance in Elasticsearch. That's, that would be it. And as I grow larger, I would probably throw up like Influx or Prometheus or something like that. So is the performance-wise, are they like similar? Uh, because I've seen some uh, benchmarks where Kibana seems to be slightly better than InfluxDB. Uh, so so I, I mean, I would say for a pure metrics performance, the, the metrics databases tend to be better. But that usually, most people aren't at that scale. I would just say that they're more feature rich. Because like, Kibana doesn't have as great features of like, if you start to need to do complex queries like over your time series, Prometheus and Influx both have great querying languages. So that, that's where the, the balance I find lies. And we just have time maybe for one more. Oh, this guy. Uh, hi. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that there are no good products in uh, distributed tracing as such. Uh, what would be uh, your important requirements for such a uh, tool or product? That's a great question. And I hope you build this. So the, what are the requirements for distributed tracing? So I think the main requirements are that applications should be able to asynchronously write to the distributed tracing engine out of order. <laughs> and somehow this distributed tracing should be able to reorder the tracing. And the number one requirement is it should have an, a UI that doesn't suck. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Matthew.